the greatest uh, thinkers in this world, a German, said, I quote, I now know philosophy, physiology, jurisprudence, medicine, science, even alas, theology from end to end with labor skin. But here I stand, O oh fool, with all my lore, no wiser than before. Which is absolutely true. Because, you know, it's wisdom that is missing in this world. T.S. Eliot so beautifully said, where is that wisdom we seem to have lost in knowledge? And where is that knowledge we seem to have lost in information? Today we only gather information. And information is full of noise. An occasional signal in the information is lost in the noise. So much so, you get so confused listening to various things. How many of you heard of this man called Creek? William Creek. C-R-E-E-C-K. Have you heard of that? Very famous German economist. Who has written an article for all of you to read. The End of Capitalism. He said Brexit and Trump's election is a sign of an imminent breaking up of capitalism of the West. Because capitalism has oversold itself. It's oversold itself so much so. Today, everything runs on money. Did you understand that? Everything runs on money. Man is of no consequence. Only money is consequence. I don't know how many of you know when the first industry started in 1802 in England, that's called the Industrial Revolution or Renaissance or what you, what you want to call it, of the last century, 18th, 19th century. There was this romantic British poet called William Wordsworth. He wrote a poem, which is called, The World is Too Much With Us. How many of you read that? The world is too much with us. I'll give you four lines. You go and read the rest. Get into Google and say, William Wordsworth, the world is too much with us. But this is a very important poem. It says, the world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Mark that line. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little do we see in nature that is ours. I'll give you an example. If your cat in the house has a tummy ache, do you know where it goes? It goes out in the garden knows which leaf to, or grass to eat and gets better. You and I get a tummy ache, we go to an ass called BMA day and get a poison and get into trouble after that, which is called ADR, adverse drug reactions. The leading cause of death in the world is ADR. Do you want to know that? You all think, oh, what is modern medicine? Western medicine is so good. Don't I have to worry. One person came and told me, look, I am rich. I want to drink good scotch whiskey every day. And I want to smoke. But at the same time, I don't want to get any disease. Can you do something? I said, I'm sorry. You have come to the wrong person. I'm not God. Then what is this? What is this modern medicine for? I just want to do what I want to do. And I want a medicine to cure it. This is the stage we will reach. Little do we see in nature that's ours. Because he says, Wordsworth says, We have sold our soul. We have sold our soul. I have added two lines for that. To the devil. Semicolon. The sordid boon. The biggest curse for mankind is we have sold our soul. Do you even bat an eyelid to cheat somebody? Tell me that. Do you? No. And you think, I can cheat the world and make money. I'll be happy. No, you're not happy. You may have the best possible things. You may have a hundred bedded, probably 120 floor house in Bombay. You may gift a 432 crores plane for your wife's birthday. And you may have all the cars in the world. But if you ask yourself a question at the end of the day, what is a car meant for? Take it from point A to B, right? What does it matter whether it's an 800 Maruti or a crore worth of uh, 7 series BMW where the door opens and closes on itself? What does it matter? You're going to the same place. See, this is the problem. But unfortunately, what happens is all of us are governed by the same emotions and passions. So beautifully said Shakespeare, whether you 
are in the palace or in the pad whether in the castle or in the cottage you are governed by the same emotions and passions greed jealousy actually greed is a very small word wall street greed is a better word that's a corporate greed wall street greed because there's no end to it just there is no end to it 13 billion dollars is the profit of one drug company one drug company in one year 13 billion dollars is the profit of one drug company in america by selling statins knowing full well that statins are poisons and they are going to kill lot of people 10% to 40% of people who take statin within one year become diabetics. Now we say we don't want diabetes. No. We are manufacturing diabetes. I have estimated 15 million people in India take statins. 15 million. That means we are manufacturing 2 million diabetics every year. And then we say India will be the capital of diabetes in the world. Naturally. This is all because of Wall Street greed. Did you understand that? What it means? Yeah. Tyrosine kinase receptor blocker. There are a lot of doctors here. You know, tyrosine kinase receptor blocker is a good anti-cancer agent. One drug manufactured in America or by an American company, maybe manufactured in China or Vietnam or Honolulu or Timbuktu, I don't know. But package and marketed by a company in America cost two and a half lakhs of rupees for one injection. And what hurts me is our cancer specialists tell the patient, with this drug you will become completely all right. I'll give you an example. One of my students who, is a, who was a professor of cardiovascular surgery in St. John's Medical College in Bangalore, 42 year, 44 year old young man, with a child and a young wife, comes down with acute myeloblastic leukemia. So his wife calls me and says, Uncle, uh, he's, he has got this, and uh, in Kidwai they say, you know, they'll treat conventionally. I said, fine, that's, that's the maximum that can happen, because acute myeloblastic leukemia, if he survives, it's, it's great, something, you know, providential. Otherwise, normally, they don't survive. How could I tell her that? Then she said, do you know why she called me? She said, sir, in Vellur, they say that's a special treatment, that's a special unit. They'll make him all right. I said, do you believe that in 2016? She said, no, no, they, they, so many people have assured me. I said, don't believe these things. These are all, you know, this advertisement. It's Kidwa is all right. You know, whatever. What he requires is TLC, tender loving care, you know, tender loving care. TLC is the best medicine for many diseases. You probably don't know that. Because ultimately the healing is done by your own body. Remember that. Healing is done by your own immune system. And not by the surgery or by any medicine that you take. Be it homeopathy, umapathy, ajurveda, anything. Ultimately it is sympathy that matters. I always tell my students, you practice whatever you want to practice. But do practice empathy and sympathy. You will be a good doctor. I will give you a study. WHO did a study in Thailand. Thailand has five systems of medicine concurrently running. Pure Western medicine, as you know, we Indians think Western medicine is the panacea for all things, right? Most of us think like that. Pure Chinese medicine, integrated Western Chinese medicine, Samoa medicine, where the father tells the son what to do when he dies, and the son tells his son when he dies, and it goes on. Then quackery, downright quackery. RM, RM, RMPs, as they call in India, registered medical practitioners. Now, the, the WHO did a study. What was the impact of these five systems of medicine on society in Thailand? Would you know what, what came out? They're equally effective. Equally effective. The quack was as effective as the best Western doctor. Because if the Western doctor has sympathy, Immune system takes over. Quack has always sympathy. That's his, that's his uh, trump card, without which he won't practice. And he is always successful. A quack is always successful. I was a student in the 50s in Madras. And opposite our big hospital, which is Asia's biggest hospital those days, there was a doctor called uh, UL, Mohar, UL, Ra, uh, UL Janardhan Rao or someone. 
a brahmin old man when i was 17 years old he was 70 years old and he was practicing medicine then with an lim which he got 70 years earlier lim means they don't eat nothing there but if we had 2000 outpatients he had about 1500 outpatients and his queue used to be from park town via china town to the the almost to beach that was the queue in the morning every day every day the old man will have a stethoscope once i saw that it's about a, a meter long because he doesn't uh, touch these patients no poor patients they smell and all they don't take bath he thinks so he has an assistant who takes a chest piece and puts it on the patient's chest like that and this fellow will keep it in the the ear piece here he uh, the, uh, the, there are three rooms the patients come in one room he sits in the middle room and the third room is on the other side every patient comes with a bottle those days there were no tablets you know when i was a student we had only few mixtures so they bought bring a bottle put the bottle there a big uh, receptacle packet will be kept and the thing is taken through the compounder's room to the other side compounder fills some medicine in some bottle which which is whose bottle is what nobody knows and that is taken to the third room and when the patients pass out they pick up their bottles and go very interesting thing happens patient comes in he is ushered in he says enna enna in tamil means what and by the time he opens his mouth that pillow is you know jargandi you know like in tirupati temple he is already jargandi next and in between the chest piece touches the patient once that's all what happens and obviously patients get better otherwise they won't come back because he doesn't advertise those days there are no television advertise or there are no paper advertise saying, saying come here we will do your you know your give a new foot or we'll give a new heart nothing like that word of mouth patients from all over chennai and the surrounding suburbs used to hawk up to ul narayan rao so that impressed me a lot as a young child i was looking at ul narayan rao and appreciating my god he is god today you know he is very scientific very very scientific my former chief in harvard who is 92 years old still directs research superwala sir his name is bernard lawn who is a nobel laureate who is that shocking machine that you they all use in the hospital he invented that he directed research about 10 years ago what did he do 600 patients over 5 year period were sent up for bypass surgery to the harvard medical school from the massachusetts cardiologist and they were doing laser tip bypass surgery is called total myocardial reflux nothing no cutting the chest and nothing of the sort patient doesn't even know you just put a catheter in and make holes in the heart and convert a man into a snake snakes don't have coronary system they suck blood from the cavity through the holes so we make a man a snake and then he is okay he said none of these people scientifically require bypass surgery so he devised a new study patient comes number 1 goes to theater a patient comes number 2 goes to theater b c a third patient fourth patient b alternate patient is at random close your eyes and randomize to do that and the protocol in theater a was in anesthetize operate send in b was anesthetize keep him sleeping when he wakes up tell him he had a wonderful operation send do nothing okay 298 here and 299 here now at the end of 5 years all these 299 who went to theater b are perfect now thallium scan shows their revascularization is 100% perfect in b in a half of them the chest pain did not go so they had to have a cut open regular surgery the other half of the half are with their maker in heaven the remaining half of the half they are having adr adverse drug reactions because of diclopidin aspirin and what have you all the blood thinners they have had cerebral hemorrhage this that and problems but those who went to theater b are all happy now what happened to them they were told at the end when they woke up from anesthesia your operation has been very successful that's it that's called the placebo effect the body's immune system corrects it and opens up collaterals just as body does in all of us sitting here all of us including the children we all have mark my words we all have coronary artery blocks if you didn't have you wouldn't be here 
about 5% of human beings don't get coronary blocks and they die before the age of 25 of a sudden heart attack. This is called preconditioning, nature preconditions. And the same nature does what it does. Now somebody wanted to know, what happens when you take a chemical medicine? Chemical medicine is a new idea, western idea. Wall Street greed, eh? you don't know that. I'll tell you what. They said, what will happen? So a professor of medicine, to be very precise, professor of genetics in Washington, Douglas C. Wallace, D. C. Wallace, did a wonderful study. He invented a chip called the MIT chip, mitochondrial chip, his own invention. So he tags it on to the drug and gives the drug to the patient and traces it where it goes. The chemical drug goes inside the system to the, the stomach and the human immune system, human wisdom says, what is this? This chemical I have not seen. My forefathers have not seen. It has never been in our race. So it must be some poison which has come in. Throw it to the kid liver. That's what happens to any poison. You take a poison, it's first sent to the liver. So every chemical drug that you swallow goes to the liver. Mark my words. Every drug goes to the liver. When it goes to the liver, the liver tries to best it possible to destroy it. If something remains, it comes out of the liver. That's called the first pass effect. Some of the medical doctors here sitting must have heard pharmacology class. First pass effect. First pass effect means what remains of the out comes out of the liver. It's a very small amount. That might do harm. But the liver is definitely damaged. That's why today we have a new disease called non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. It's an epidemic actually. When I was a student, we only knew one thing. Cirrhosis means alcoholic cirrhosis. Now, new disease is almost cirrhosis, alcoholic cirrhosis has disappeared because people are now afraid of drinking too much of alcohol. There are a few. But every one of us possibly is a candidate for non-alcoholic cirrhosis. Is this not, if it's not greed, what else is? Tell me. So, Douglas so beautifully showed that none of these drugs are accepted by the human system. Whereas he tried Chinese and Tibetan herbs. He didn't try Ayurveda because Ayurveda is very unpopular in the West. Or at least it's becoming popular now. But in America, Ayurveda has not been very popular. But he took Chinese herbs and Tibetan herbs. The minute the herb goes into the stomach, the stomach says, Aha, this is new. This is new. I know it. It's a part of the food that my ancestors were taking. And it's not thrown into the liver and directly goes and if it can do some good, it does. This is what happens with all herbal medicines. Unfortunately, the present Ayurveda in India, any Ayurvedic physicians here? They are also now trying reductionist medicines. The other day I was, other day means about a year ago or two years ago, I was lecturing at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. They get crores of money for research. And they were telling me, sir, we tried this, you know, Ayurveda is all hocus pocus, sir. We tried this Brahmi, Brahmi, you know Brahmi, Ekpatta, which is supposed to be good for memory. My grandmother used to give us chutney of uh, Brahmi before we go to the exam. I still remember that. Brahmi, you know that. What do you call that in Hindi? Kya bolta hai isko? Kya? Brahmi chi? Aha. Ekpatta. Malayal lehen tabari ne? Ekpatta le. Hindi tabari ne? Brahmi. Nama Kannad Dali Timar, now Tuluinal Timar and Telte, Timar, Timar Chatni, Timar Gutta, Balaruchi, Balaruchi, very nice. Anyway, they were saying it's useless, sir. We tried so much of it. Then I told them, what did you try? And chemical extract of Brahmi. I said, chemical extract of Brahmi is not Brahmi. I said, why don't you try Brahmi Chatni itself? And two or three boys in the, the audience, you know, some of these young boys are very, uh, you know, they are imaginative. They said, yes. But they came and told me, sir, we won't get any grant for this. I said, why don't you? You just write to the D DRDO and you will get, or DST. Why not you get it? So I talked to the secretary of DST. I said, why don't you fund this kind of refutative research? You know, all your rubbish research, crores of rupees of taxpayers' money is wasted on repetitive research. Me too research. Somebody has done in America something, I am going to do it here and see what happens. This is called repetitive research. Remember, knowledge does not advance by repeating known things. Knowledge advances by refuting false dogmas. 
I'll give you an example. 127 AD, Galen said, blood circulates from the liver. Okay? For 1500 years, every ass of a professor, researcher, PhD said, liver pumps blood. It was in the year 1628, a London doctor, practicing doctor who didn't have much practice, who was going for a walk in the evening, saw a fire hydrant and got some stimulated idea and went back to his laboratory and did a lot of dissection of animals and found out heart pumps blood and he said, cogito dimoto cordis, dimoto cordis. In Latin, dimoto cordis is heart pumps blood. That was in 1628, that means 1500 days, every ass thought liver pumps blood. They taught the same thing in the medical school. Can you believe that? So, repeating known things does not take knowledge forwards. Refuting false dogmas takes knowledge forwards, said Karl Popper, a great thinker, who was a professor of science philosophy in the London School of Economics in the 50s and 60s. He's a colossus. Popper said, think of refuting false dogmas, of which there are many in every field, every single field. That's what Creek was saying. This economics, which we think is economics, macroeconomics, is going to end sooner than later. The signs are already there in the horizon. Trump coming up. The whole media saying Hillary will come up. And suddenly Trump comes up. See? Brexit. Cameron was so happy, so confident that no, what is happening, I'll come. Something has come up. The white supremacy is coming up. Which means we'll go back to the time of the Nazis again. See? Think of it. White supremacy in, in America. Here is a very funny system. The American system is such that only the rich people will win at the end of the day. Hillary gets uh, thousands of votes more than uh, Trump in the popular vote. But in the collegiate system, he gets more. How can you believe that? Very funny, isn't it? Very funny. Now, this is, these are all signs. So I say, Western science has had an overdose of itself. And sooner than later, this science will be exposed, exposed. Do you understand that? If any one of you is keen on reading, younger generation, I'll give you a book, nice book, written by two physics professors in New York, called The Golem. The book's name is The Golem, G-O-L-E-M. Any one? Golem in the Malayalam? Any, you know, a lot of Malayalam is here. What Golem? Golem. Golem in there. In there? Yes? Huh? Golem alla mole. Golem. In there? In there? In there? Huh? In there? G O L E M is a Hebrew word. It's not an English word. Hebrew and Malayalam are the same meaning. In Hebrew, G O L E M, Golem means. Scarecrow. Malayalitra than me. Ada, Pinan, Pinan, Yan and Varnu. So, this is a beautiful book which says The Golem. That means science, as we are taught in school and college, is something that has been created, created by the Wall Street greed to keep us under their control. See, today, for example, you say, oh, Western medicine is scientific. Oh, it's scientific. Yeah, I'll take it. What is science? Tell me what is science. In the bala? The vice president of the, uh, of the, of the dental association. <clears throat> Keep you under control. You think, oh, it's scientific, then it must be good. They say, evidence-based science. Western medicine is evidence-based science. Where is the evidence? That you don't ask. You say evidence-based science. Oh, this Ayurveda? No, no, it's all good. No, not science. Who said it's not science? Actually, Ayurveda is a bigger science than the Western science. And the Western medical science is totally wrong, totally flawed. And this became a science. If you want to know the history, you'll be shocked. How did medicine become a science? The Western medicine started as mumbo-jumbo, sorcery and witchcraft on the Nile Valley 5,000 years ago. From there it moved. From Nile Valley it moved, it came to Egypt. And in Egypt, then other parts of Egypt had a lot of time. Then it came to Arabia, actually. And in Arabia, there was a great man called Ibn Sina, whom the Westerners call as Avicenna. 
ഹി ഇസ് നോട്ട് അവിസെന്ന ഹി ഇസ് ഇബ്ൻ സീന ഐ ബി എൻ എസ് ഐ ഇ എൻ ഇബ്ൻ സീന ഡിഡ് ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് മോഡിഫിക്കേഷൻസ് ഫോർ ദി വെസ്റ്റേൺ മെഡിസിൻ ആൻഡ് ഫ്രം ഹിയർ ഇറ്റ് വെൻ ടു ഗ്രീസ് ആൻഡ് ബൈ ദ ടൈം ഇറ്റ് റീച്ച് ഗ്രീസ് അലക്സാണ്ടർ ദ ഗ്രേറ്റ് ഹാഡ് ഇൻവൈഡ് ഇന്ത്യ ആൻഡ് കം ബാക്ക് ഇൻ ഇ ഡൈഡ് ഇൻ പർഷ്യ but alexander's followers came back to alexandria a city which he had built for intellectual activity and the big building he had built called academia so we say i am in academics you ask the people what is academics they won't know the academics means reading books and going to the library is called academy no academia is the building where academics started where people come and have two kinds of things a symposium symposium they come and talk like this agree to disagree eat and dine and wine and go or seminar seminar comes from semen so seminar is a discussion where new thoughts come out now so new things born today we interchangeably use it in any way you like but the original thing is symposium is totally different from seminar seminar is different from symposium that is why academics anybody who goes there is supposed to be an academic not because you go to the library and have a phd you know what phd is ha huh? <laughs> phd doctor philosophy ha huh? good <laughs> yes no if you steal from one person it's called plagiarism when you steal from 100 people it's called phd <laughs> did you get that yeah that's that's the difference between the two plagiarism also in you know, a high level people do plagiarism doesn't matter but uh, if you today in india the situation is a little different i don't know how many of you know the ugc is that even to become an assistant professor you must have a phd so we have phd is galore now very interesting every other person is a phd and it's very easy to get phd because you know even in america you can get phd if there are the institutions where you give 5000 dollars you will get a phd thesis written and you get a phd in india it is still cheaper you don't have to go that far you get very cheap there are people who write phd thesis you have to give them the subject there are examiners who give you a pass there are universities which connive with that can you believe that all this happens because the greed at the end it's again economics greed if you get a phd you get a promotion if you get a phd you get a higher pay if you get a phd you are better so it is better than the others is one up manship so this is how the world runs remember that now come back to douglas black's work what did douglas black show any drug that you give which is a reductionist chemical destroys the body destroys the liver and damages the liver and if any any good effect comes it is from what little comes out of the liver and the leading cause of death today in the west is adverse drug reactions and the doctors establishment is the leading cause of death did you know that the medical establishment is the leading cause of death in five countries in the last 25 years doctors went on strike where there are no private doctors saskatchewan in canada 25 years ago los angeles county 15 years ago bogota in colombia 10 years ago and recently in israel doctors went on strike an audit now shows each time the doctors went on strike death rate simply disappeared almost came down <laughs> morbidity came down can you believe that nurses were running the hospital recently in dublin there is a very interesting thing the junior doctors went on strike the senior consultants were still holding fort but the senior consultant has forgotten how to give intravenous drips and you know the simple things the procedures how to incise an abscess etc etc so much so interventions came down and mortality came down and morbidity came down british medical journal wrote a beautiful editorial doctors going on strike will improve society's health for sure <laughs> did you get that now comes the very famous 14 country study of the industrialist countries from japan to usa and this study is published you want the reference write down is us medicine the best in the world that's the heading nam doctors forum uh, our ophthalmologist is writing is us medicine the best in the world write down that's the heading 
The author's name is Barbara Starfield, who teaches community medicine in Johns Hopkins Hospital. She's a very nice girl. And she, they wanted to kill her. Eventually, she died of an accident. I don't know who, whether she is killed or not. And this, paper, this article came in the JAMA, JAMA, J-A-M-E. More idea? Huh. 2000, year is 2000. Semicolon, volume is 284. Colon, page is 483. Why can I? This is a free article. You go to Google and say, Barbara Starfield, is US medicine the best in the world? JAMA 2000, semicolon 284, colon 483. And you will see for your shock that the leading cause of death is a medical establishment. Why? Over-intervention, over-diagnosis, mismanagement, over-management, under-management. A study showed that people who don't have high blood pressure genuine disease, just you know, their pressure is slightly raised when they see a doctor, which is called white coat hypertension. These people are unnecessarily drugged and the drugs produce problems. People of genuine high blood pressure with a lot of problems, they are not adequately treated and they die. So they have either over treatment or under treatment. Seeing this, Mary Tinetti, who is the professor of medicine in Yale, wrote a nice study in the Archives of Internal Medicine. Archives of Internal Medicine. The heading is, write down the heading. Mary Tinetti. Mary, M A R Y T I N N E T I. Mary Tinetti. The end of the disease era. That's the heading of the article. What is the heading of the article? The end of the disease era. That means this diagnosis is the curse. Diagnosis is a disease in itself. You make a diagnosis and attack it. You don't you know what happens to the human being, you're not worried. You're only worried about attacking the, the, the diagnosis. Archives of internal medicine. Arch Int Med 2004. Volume 116, page 179. Now read this, and Mary tells you that all that we do today is either over treatment, under treatment, mistreatment, or maltreatment, but not real treatment. Anyway, why did I say all this, pre pre this preface? Just to tell you that you are here because of you and not because of doctors. You are here if you are alive. In spite of doctors, you are terribly lucky. Did you get that message? Just telling you the truth. That is, you are cured by your own immune system. This is the most important thing. And our job should be to boost our immune system. That's the essence of Ayurveda. Swastasya, swastarakshitam. Preserve the health of the well. How do you do that? Boost the immune system. Panchakarma, for example. Ayurveda's thrust is panchakarma. There are five methods of boosting your immune system. But I tell you, better than that, there is only one system. Love everybody. Love everybody. Hate nobody. Don't do anything in overdose. Do what you love and love what you do. Have a wife or husband of your choice if you can. But if you can't, love the husband or the wife that you get. All wives are happy. <laughs> All wives are happy. But the truth. There's a beautiful book called Stress and Distress. Written by one of the pundits of stress research called Kev, what is his name? O'Malley. No. no. His name is uh, something else. Anyway, I'll come back to that. And he writes there beautifully. If you love what you do, and if you love your surroundings, all the associates, you love your boss, you love your assistant, you love your wife, you love your husband, you have no problem at all in life. Our problem is we don't love people. We hate people, H-A-T-E, and that's the most dangerous thing to happen. When you hate somebody, your problems start. That is why in Ayurveda, there are five levels of the mind. The mind is one word in English language, but in Sanskrit there are five levels. Manas is the mind of a child. You know, so beautiful. Have you seen a child, newborn child? Recently? 
No. If you are not, go to the maternity ward and see the newborn child. There are two kinds of children. One child comes out and very curious. You know. Another child. The first one is coming here for the first time. So it's curious to know what's happening. The second one has come here several times. It couldn't care less what is happening. It has seen it all. But they smile at everyone the minute they start spotting people. Maybe a few months. Smile at anybody. BM Agde comes, it smiles. Jiten comes, it smiles. And whoever comes, it smiles. But do you do that? No, you don't do that. You smile at certain people and you don't want to see someone else's face. That is where the problem starts. I've been following this, what's called HRV. We were doing studies for about 40 years now. Heart rate variability. A child's heart is very interesting. When the child breathes, the heart runs fast. When the child breathes out, it runs slow. Which we, foolish Western physiologists call it as sinus arrhythmia. That is the real rhythmia. Arrhythmia is health and rhythmia is death. Now, as you grow old and start hating people, then your heart becomes regular and regular and regular and regular. HRV decreases. And the day it totally stops and you are absolutely regular, you are dead. Don't laugh, I am seriously telling you. <laughs> I wish I had my slides to show you how this happens, you know. These people who become absolutely regular are dead within about a couple of hours. But the, you can bring them from that state to the child state by doing pranayama. So beautifully. And pranayama is so good that you can bring them back to what is called tranquility. And that's where you can treat or you know, use preventive measures. Yoga has that capacity to do that. That's why thanks to our Prime Minister, yoga has now been recognized all over the world. A movement which he moved in the UNO Record 172 countries okayed it to have 21st of June as the International Yoga Day. 172 countries. And today you must see, you know, I was in Lisbon last year. They invited me. There's a fascinating place in Lisbon. And there's, there's a man who is, a, who is a Portuguese but calls himself Swami Surya Prakashananda or somebody and has the ochre robe. And he has got a big band of people doing yoga. And I was there for the 21st and then we went up to the days. And one old lady comes. Old lady comes. Oh, how old is she? 98. 98. And she says, I have been doing yoga for the last 40 years. And she comes. It's a very high days. And some of us had to be helped. She just jumps up and comes. You know, I always tell, you can say a man is healthy or not by knowing what he takes two at a time. Did you get that? Stairs and pills. If he takes two stairs at a time, he will live another 50 years. If he takes two pills at a time, I don't know how long he will live. This girl, this girl was taking two steps, jumping, you know, two stairs. And then she comes and we stand there and we all say, Om. This girl says, Om. By the time we all finished, this girl was still saying, Oh, 98. Can you believe that? Such a long vital capacity. So much a vital capacity. Maximum breathing capacity. And her joints were so good because she was using them. That's why now for the Canadian Gerontology Association, I've told them, you teach your people two things. A, Indian dance forms. Bharatanatyam. If you are a Bharatanatyam exponent, your joints will be supple even when you are 100. And if you are one of those chanting the Om, your maximum capacity will remain the same for any number of years you live. The two things that happen as age advances, A, joint mobility comes down, B, the vital capacity comes down. And you must see these people. And that's how the sinus arrhythmia of a child comes back to the adult also when once you become a child. When do you become a child? When you have no hang-ups. Child has no hang-up. I shouldn't talk to these people. No, I shouldn't. You know, this is a meeting. I should like this and I should. Why all those restrictions? You want to yawn? Yawn to your heart's content. 
Child yawns, no? You must see the sophisticated westernized lady. <laughs> Why that? You want to, you know, burp? Burp. It's normal. It's... You want to fart? Fart loudly. <laughs> what is there? Haven't you seen Auden's poem on farting? He says, you must know how to fart. Very nice. Auden, very big uh, English poem. He says, his poem is there. No man can smell his fart. <laughs> you can smell everyone else's fart, not yours. You, you know, some realize, a child doesn't restrict it. Supposing it wants to fart, just a child doesn't say, I'll hold it on. Each time you hold it on, your blood pressure goes up. You're holding it on, breathing against closed glottis, which is Valsalva Menor. You're almost killing yourself. Remember that. Fart, man. What is there? <laughs> no, I'm just not joking. Seriously telling you. Become a child. Become a child in every aspect of it. That means your heart rate variability will come back to child sinus arrhythmia. And when once that happens, that's why that is a manas. Now the child is sent to school. Right? There, child is given some information. Time I am on eh? Ini jangan ini restrict time ini lain dengan apa yang jadi. Anggana, sorry. Time limit restricts, you know. Yesterday I was worried because you know this uh, the time is there, so much of programs to go on, and the children were waiting for dancing, etc. So I didn't want to. Anggana, itu jangan baru, all restrict tak? And the blood pressure went up masa. Ini all free for all, anda betul tu. So what happens? You just send the child to school. School is said. This is BMI day. This is so and so. That is so and so. This is so and so. Etc. Etc. And that level of the mind is called buddhi. You know what buddhi is? What you are told. You are told. You are told you should not fart in public. That is buddhi. But child doesn't have buddhi. It is a manas. It farts. So buddhi. That is why I say every newborn child is a genius. Wrote Alexis Carroll. Only to be converted to an idiot in school. So you become an idiot. So in the minute you become an idiot, then you become buddhi. Then after buddhi is the next level, where buddhi creates chitta. Chitta is buddhi plus ego. <clears throat> I, I am BM Hegde. I am A, B, C, D, E, F, G or some whatever it is. That is called chitta. And that's the level you get a lot of problems in the mind. Chitta, vritti, undulations. Nirodha yoga ha, Patanjali wrote. At the chitta level, you have so much of vegetation in the mind. If you can control it, put a nirod there, not the government one, it leaks. But the real one. <laughs> <laughs> you, you become a sannyasi, you become so tranquil. So that's exactly what is called yoga. Chitta, Vritti, Nirodha, Yoga. Yoga is not Kusti. All that Kusti you do, asanas, they are not yoga. Real yoga is Chitta, Vritti, Nirodha, Yoga. And yoga is not uh, joining the Atman with Paramatman, etc., etc. Actually, Patanjali was an atheist. He never believed in God. But Chitta is Chitta, Vritti, Nirodha, Yoga. So, no religion can have any objection for yoga because it's not anything to do with religion. It's just the mind. That's all. And that's very interesting to know that. And last is, what is asana for? Asana is also important. Because each time you stretch your muscles, the tendons release opioids. You relax. That's why it's called stiram sukham asana. For constant ease, you must do asana. So, you do asana first and then sit and do pranayama. You become chitta vritti nirodha yoga. So, you become a child at the end of the day and you love the whole world. And you love your enemy. That's what Jesus said, love the enemy. You even love your enemy because you forget why you in the first place you become a, and forgiveness comes and forgiveness is the biggest thing. Ayurveda says, Kshamavan, forgive. Apto pasevi bhaveta arogyam. Now I was so happy this morning here because they said Kannada, the, the Indian associations have come together, come together. Coming together is progress. Staying together is probably what you need. And we must stay together because you are now in a far off country. Not, of course, physically not very far off from India. But you are in a foreign country. This is your karma mumi. Love the Kuwaitans. You have to love the Kuwaitans because it is they who have given you a place to work here and thrive. So you love them. Your health improves. 
then you love yourselves. You know, now the latest Western studies have shown that the old Indian large family systems are very healthy. Their sense of belonging. You know, we were, I still remember the days when I was a child in my father's house. We were 66 children in the house. 66 children. And it's fun. Suppose in the morning there is idli, let us say, for breakfast. Most of the time it is ganji, but if you say idli, one idli is cut into four pieces. So you are given three pieces. That means three idlis you are given. That is three-fourths of the idli you have at the end of the day. And chutney is like that. You just touch it and check. And it goes that far. But it was fun. We used to pick one from the other plate and say, run and eat and things like that. At night we had to drink milk. I still remember that. It's called pear near. Pear near means water in milk. <laughs> At the end of the day it was only water. There is no, no milk in it. So it gets diluted, diluted, diluted and you get small quantities. So that is how life was. But it was real fun. Today, father, mother, husband and child. Father goes out for work. Tension, whether he will come back or not. Mother goes out, tension. Child goes out, you don't know, will somebody kidnap the child. So all three of you, the blood pressure keeps going up. So the tension, so they say, the sense of belonging. You know, uncles, aunties, grannies and so many people to look after. Today you have to have a nanny and the nanny is not interested in the child, but the granny is interested in the grandchild. So nanny will look after the child much better than the nanny. And that's, that's the enjoyment of him. So, sense of belonging. So, do you know what the West does now? They always do something. They call church groups. Not that they go to church. Nobody goes to church in the West now. They call church groups a group where they behave like a family. So, my suggestion is, KKK is a bad name. Ku Klux Khan. KKK, IAD, IADK, IDAK, IDF. Treat yourselves as one family, one family. Don't have that. <laughs> come together, enjoy together. At least once in three months, have a combined meeting where you discuss topics of common interest. Or so you call some ass like B. M. and ask him to talk some nonsense. All that is good because you know you just want to while away your time, forget your past, forget your worries. You know worries and things like that keep killing you. So you forget it. You treat yourself. So my suggestion would be, you be a good one organization and love your karma bhumi and do something for your janma bhumi also. You know? <laughs> do something. At least remove the myths about India that the West and the other countries have. It's all not true. You would be surprised. India had the hoariest science in the past. But great. Now talking about it is no good. But we shouldn't talk. Let's see what the Western thinkers say. Voltaire said, I quote, Voltaire is a great friend thinker. He said, when we were hunter-gatherers roaming the forest, these Indians had universities of excellence in five places where wise people from all over the world flock to get more wisdom. What a beautiful saying. Iliabas, Bandaban, Takshila, Banaras and Nalanda. What a beautiful thing. You go, to, you go to Gaya and see the Nalanda. Still the structure is there. And the structure is so beautiful. They want to re revive that. And you must see the gown, the Nalanda University Convocation gown, which is so good compared to the Ku Klux Klan gown that we use from the ecumenical 12th century European universities that we have. You know, it looks like a burqa actually. All this we have forgotten. Now, in quantum physics, a man gets the Nobel Prize and an alternate Nobel Prize for finding out that energy and matter are identical. Matter is energy and energy is matter. He calls it as E is equal to M. And he calls it as A duality, A duality, A duality. That means no duality. But the man writes an article for you. Read this. Matter is not made out of matter. Article the pair in there. Matter is not made out of matter. His name is Hans, H-A-N-S. Peter, P-E-T-E-R, Dürer, D-U-R-R. Hans Peter Dürer. There he says, I call it as A-duality because there is no duality between matter and energy. But who am I compared to the Indian sages who thousands of years ago called it as Advaita? Who says that? Hans Peter Dürer. You and I don't know. And he quotes the Upanishads. 
to prove that matter is energy, energy is matter and the two are the same. Vahirantas chabutanam. It is inside and outside of everything. Charam acharam evacha. It moves all the time but looks very solid. You all look solid. There's nothing solid about you. You are just a bundle of jumping leptococcus, jumping electrons. Sukshmavate tavijnayam. It's so subtle that no vijnana, no science can see it. Absolutely true. You can't see an electron even today. Nobody has seen an electron, but people have got Nobel Prize for describing an electron without seeing it. And if you say there is God, they say, where is where? Have you seen God? I haven't seen God. But have you seen an electron? No. Why did you get a Nobel Prize for saying electron is particle? Or electron is wave? Or electron is wavicle? Or electron is nothing? Each one of them got the Nobel Prize. J.J. Thompson in 1906 got the Nobel Prize for saying that electrons are particles. He was the director of the Cavendish Institute in Cambridge. 30 years later, his own son, J.G. Thompson, gets the Nobel Prize for saying that they are waves. Father said they are particles, son said it is waves. And er Erwin Schrodinger gets it for, he said they are waves and particles at different times, wavicles. See? And all this is because we believed blindly Western science is correct and ours is wrong. This is the problem. We have a real problem, a mindset. We don't understand these things. And if you read their book, The Golem, written by two physics professors, <laughs> Colin Harris. Colin Harris and Trevor Pinch, P-I-N-C-H. Trevor Pinch. This is a very small book. You get an Indian edition on Amazon.com for 75 rupees or a Western edition for about $5. And read the book. It will tell you what is a huge thing fraud called science. And these are not uh, villagers like BMI Day. They have professors of physics in New York. They have written that. And you must see, none of these scientific methods have any proof E is equal to mc squared. Theory of relativity. 16 experiments showed that is wrong. But it is being taught even today in schools and colleges. Right? But 1925, there was a student in Zurich Polytechnic who was being taught by Einstein himself. And the student got up and said, and the old man was explaining E is equal to mc squared. He got up and said, sir, you are talking through your hat. It's all bullshit, he told. What will happen to a student who tells a Nobel laureate professor that he is talking bullshit? What left to the student? He becomes an outstanding student, standing outside. <laughs> For how many years? 30 years. And then gets the Nobel Prize. And the only Nobel Prize which is worth its gold is the Nobel Prize this student gets. And his name is Werner Heisenberg, who said, uncertainty principle. There is no certainty about anything. PQ is not equivalent to QP. 2 into 3 may be 6, but 3 into 2 need not be 6. We don't teach this in school. 2 into 2 is 4 always, right? Thermodynamics. Fluid can't grow up, can it? No. You keep liquid helium in a bowl, hang it up. After two days, the helium goes up and comes down. Where is thermodynamics? See, we don't believe this, do we? No. They said ether was there. Ether, that's where telephone used to go through ether. Now we know there is no ether. And you are still taught in school that inside an atom is a central nucleus and then electrons go round in circles, they jump from one thing to another. Right? 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 There is nothing inside any atom. There is nothing inside an atom. 1920, Annie Besant, Charles Leadbeater, her boyfriend, and Babington, their colleague, come from Cambridge to get more wisdom in India and go to Himalayas and meditate and become yogis. And she writes a book. Annie Besant has written a book. Next time you are in Chennai, buy this book. And the book is called Occult Chemistry. Small book. Occult Chemistry. Annie Besant. Annie Besant, you know, who started the Congress party with all the problems for us now. Anyway, now coming back to Annie Besant herself. She wrote this beautiful book where she says, when I become a yogic siddhi and when I get into that elevated state of consciousness, I can visualize the inside of atoms. And nine atoms from helium to hydrogen. And I know there is nothing inside an atom. When did she write? 1920. 
Now quantum physics says there is nothing inside an atom. Can you believe that? And this is what the books write and you read and you believe. And that's exactly what is called the Western medicine. My friend was telling yesterday, we have a wonderful drug now. What is that? Receptor blockers. And this, the minute you find a receptor blocker, you get a Nobel Prize. You find something very great, no Nobel Prize. Receptor blockers research is funded by the drug company. So they plant a man called Venkat Raman in Cambridge University. He finds a receptor blocker, he gets the Nobel Prize. But at the same time, the first receptor blocker researcher, Candace Pert, who was working in NIH under Saul Snyder, found out that the opioid receptors are outside the brain also. For the first time, she found out. But the boss stole the data and wrote a paper and tried to get a Nobel Prize. So this girl found out in time, went to the Nobel Committee, showing her ledger and said, it's my work, he has quoted. So the boss and the assistant both didn't get the Nobel Prize. The result was, this girl loses her job in NIH. Her name is Candace Pert. What's her name? Candace Pert. NIH is the, you know, the highest court or the highest palace for research in America. National Institute of Health. And Candace was thrown out. But she wrote a book. She wrote a beautiful book. Please read this book. Molecules of Emotion. What's the book? Molecules of Emotion. Candace Pert. P-E-R-T. C-A-N-D-A-C-E. And Candace writes in this book so beautifully. Time has come for us now not to reach to a tablet counter when you have a headache, but to sit in a quiet place in your own house, meditate for a little while and elevate your consciousness and tell yourself their headache will go and the headache will go. This is called quantum healing. There's a beautiful book written by one Indian professor of physics in, in America. It's called Quantum Doctor. Please read that book. Quantum Doctor is a great professor. Probably Soporkar may know him. His name is... Uh, what's his name? Goswami. Amit Goswami. Amit Goswami is professor of quantum physics in the University of... University of uh, Eugene in... Uh, what is that place called? Oregon. And Amit is a very nice man. Amit has read a beautiful book. And Amit was nominated for Nobel three times but didn't get the Nobel Prize. Amit was the one who started that CERN reactor thing in France. Millions of, billions, billions of dollars are spent there. Now Amit says it's a foolish thing because there are no particles at all. Why continue that? But people want to continue there because there is a big research grant. It's a joke. Western research is a joke. I wrote a letter to Abdul Kalam. Why send a man to moon? 100,000 crores of Indian money. We have 45 million Indian children who do not have more than one, not even one meal. They suffer from a disease called NIDES. Have you heard of NIDES? You all heard of AIDS, right? Did you know AIDS and, and the HIV virus has nothing in it common? No? No. Other dentists, they, you think AIDS now? Hmm? Very interesting. This is created for making money to sell Zaduvidin. Read this book as a dentist. Inventing the AIDS virus. Inventing the AIDS virus. Aya. Written by Peter Duesberg. P E T E R. Duesberg, D-U-E-S-B-E-R-G. He's professor of virology in the Berkeley University. And this book has a foreword by a Nobel laureate who was the father of PCR test. What's his name? PCR test. Huh? What was the name? Carrie Mullis. And Carrie writes, Peter and I don't know what causes AIDS, but there's no cause for AIDS. But Peter and I know one thing for certain, which nobody can dispute because he's the best virologist in the world, having got the Genius of Century Award. And I'm the father of the PCR test which identifies viruses. Nobody can dispute. And Peter and I do not think HIV virus has anything to do with AIDS. Full stop. Unquote. 
But you and I believe. See, this is what, what we are... You and I are made to believe in wrong things for the sake of... What is called? Wall Street greed. Manslebole. Wall Street greed. But my happiness is, I love that man Creek. Because I have been saying that modern medicine has oversold itself. And it is coming near its end. It's almost its end. And that's why the West, there is a craze for alternate medicines. Would you know the budget of Europe's last year's alternate medicine? 70 billion dollars. Is it music to the ears of Ayurveda people? 70 billion dollars. There's so much a movement of Ayurveda today. Four months ago, I was in Germany for an Ayurvedic conference of Europe. Again, in June, they have invited me to London for another meeting. See, there's, there's a thick movement. Universities are interested. People are interested in Ayurveda because... They have almost seen the horizon of Western medicine, non-scientific medicine, using linear mathematics as the base. And linear mathematics cannot be the base of modern science of human beings because human being is non-linear. Universe is non-linear. And quantum physics now says, non-locality, things happen elsewhere. Supposing I am thinking about my friend in London now, some photons of mine will be acting on the hand man and you wouldn't believe it happens, you know. You seriously think. Yesterday I finished my thing. I reached my room at 7.55. I just opened my door, my phone rings. And this man says, you must have finished your meeting. You must have come back. I just wanted to say hello to you. Can you believe that? Honest to God. I'm, I'm, uh, see, he's, he's about 85-year-old man called Linus. Uh, he's a, such a nice man. He is my friend and he has to call me wherever I am in the world twice a day. And he knows to call me when I am in my room. That's the interesting part of it. He exactly knows. This is called non-locality. And non-locality was condemned by Einstein. He said, oh, it can't happen. Everything must happen here in my laboratory. Locality. Non-locality. What do you mean? Is God playing dice with the world? Einstein asked. Today he should be ashamed. Because today... Even we know what's called transportation, teleportation. You can convey an idea at a distance without any telephone wire, without any, yes, what is it called, cell phone and things like that. Experiments showed that you can provo evoke a potential in a brain of a yogi or a mystic. You can electrically evoke a potential and tell the yogi, transmit this potential to all your sishas. And would you believe? The potential gets transferred to the brains of all his sisters. There's a yogi, professor of physics in Stanford University called William Teller. William Teller can idea, convey his idea to any matter. He will keep a glass of water here and say, he will concentrate on that and say, let this water have pH of 4.5, pH of 4.5, pH of 4.5. After some time you take that water, pH of 4.5. You drink it, it's water, but the pH is 4.5. You know the pH of this water? RO, RO, reverse osmosis water, slightly acidic. Be careful when you drink it. So if you want to drink it, let put little lime in it and drink it. So that it becomes alkaline. So you don't know what's happening in this world. You and I are taken for a ride. So friends, with all this background knowledge, now let me tell you, lifestyle change is the only future for your health. Your health is in your hands. It's not in anyone's hands. It's not in doctor's hands, medicine's hands, no. You don't know when once you get a disease, what will happen to you. The greatest neurosurgeon, one of the best neurosurgeons in America, an Indian boy, youngster, very interesting boy. He gets cancer at a young age. Lung cancer. Boy who married an American girl, they were planning to have a child, and he gets a little cough and loses weight and then writes a book. Book in the name? Good. Good girl. Mola nalla mola. Pare. When breath becomes air. You must read that book. You will cry. You will cry. He's the best boy. Best neurosurgeon. And he is, he is supposed to be the best. And five universities wanted him as professor. But he chooses his own university, Stanford. And joins there. His wife is an internist. And they join. And then they choose the best cancer specialist in America. Because they are, you know, Western says, you know, 
They say, Google it and they get the best cancer specialist. And this girl says, don't worry. Your cancer has three treatments. One, a tablet a day, 20 years life. If it fails, chemotherapy, five years of life. If it fails, radiation, surgery, another five years of life. So you have another 25 years of life, you can plan your family. Husband and wife plan for a child. And she becomes pregnant. Tablet fails, chemotherapy fails, to cut the long story short, he dies. But before dying, he writes this book. This boy has done masters in English literature before going to the medical school in Yale. And he is a fantastic English, I tell you. This is a book worth its weight in gold. When breath becomes air. What a beautiful thing. When breath becomes air is a poem written by Walt Whitman. And the same poems title he takes for the book. And if you read that book, you know, this relying on doctors, medicines and things like that is like relying on the devil. You rely on yourself. You say, let me not get cancer. If I get cancer, God, God only can help. I mean, if money can do and treat, Jaya Lalita would have died? Would she have died? She shouldn't have died. Because she can command anything in the world. But then, it has limitations. That is why, don't get into a situation where you go into that, what is called the mortuary, pre-mortuary. That is intensive care unit. Ultimate destination is the mortuary. But before that, you go through the intensive care unit, so that you drain yourself of all the, your savings and, and your, 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 your other things. So, Lifestyle. What a beautiful saying. Very simple, very simple. Eat half of what you want to eat. Supposing you, are, you want to eat four idlis, stop at two idlis. You will live probably another 20 years longer. Studies showed rats fed full stomach lived half the time of rats just fed half stomach. Can you believe that? So stop when you think you can eat equal amount. And eat in moderation and don't have any restrictions. Well, who told you you must have a breakfast in the morning, a lunch in the afternoon and evening? Nothing. Whenever you feel hungry, you eat something. When you don't feel hungry, don't eat nothing. So eating at, you know, in the olden days, one pediatrician killed a lot of children in America. He said, time feed a child. You know, two o'clock, breastfeeding, three o'clock, something else, four o'clock, something else. Then when a lot of children died, he said, I'm sorry. Child knows when it wants food. It cries. Feed it. Don't overload it. There are even now Western, aping uh, Indian mothers who feed by the clock. Don't do that. You also don't do that. But one good advice which I gave yesterday is uh, good. Don't eat in the after the sundown. These Jains, you know, the Jitain and all, they don't eat after sundown. They call it as uh, palahara. That means they eat everything. Other than rice, that's all. <laughs> that's what happens. But anyway, we had a lot of good ideas. Don't eat. Number two, help as many people as you can. Each time you help somebody, that fellow will not be grateful to you. Forget it. He'll be ungrateful to you. But you are benefiting yourself. Because your body is built in such a way that paropakarartam idam shariram. You are here for others. And so try to do good to everybody. But the minute you do some good to somebody, follow Jesus. Let not the right hand know what the left hand does. Forget. And if you forget, you are happy. If you don't forget, and if you say, okay, I help B.M. Agde. And when B.M. Agde harms you, you feel terribly bad. And there was a Ashutosh Mukherjee was a great teacher in Bengal. He was told one day, by you know, he was an old man, somebody said, See, so and so was bad mouthing you so badly. Then he smiled. Here, I am telling you the truth, why are you smiling? He smiled and said, No, no, I am only thinking, when did I help him? Because without if you don't help somebody, they won't bad mouth you. So you forget, but help you must. You must go out of your way to help sometime. Because it helps you. Because he is you. Remember that? We, you and I are just leptoquarks. He is a leptoquark. And the same leptoquark exchanges between you and him. 
and your same consciousness and same mind and his mind and your mind are connected so if you help someone else or someone else helps you he or she gets the benefit out of it and that's the next thing that you do ayurveda is so good nitya hita mita ahara sevi in moderation what you like a lot of people say you sit down there and say does it have cholesterol does it have this that that itself will give you blood pressure whether it is cholesterol or poison you eat it finished and this eating that we have been doing our ancestors have been doing has come by what's called observational research why didn't people eat some poisonous fruit they have seen over thousands of years that eating that fruit will kill you and how did we choose who told you to eat rice who told you to eat wheat like for example who why why do you eat potato and sweet potato solanaceae plants are there in the wild for 500 varieties but only two varieties you eat the rest of them are all poisonous so we are so lucky there's so much research in the past today's research is what measuring things do you know what is called the western research called, called? fish net hypothesis how many of you know what is fish net hypothesis are you there john von neumann is a great uh, you know hungarian born american chemist who got the nobel prize for chemistry he said fish net hypothesis ichthyologists ichthyologists you know fish fishes fishes these fishes went to the far the, the sea to study fish so they caught fish came back to the laboratory used a vernier caliper measured everything up and down and said one conclusion what's the hypothesis all sea fish are bigger than 2 inches in length that became a proposal it became hypothesis then became thesis and then became a theory that's how science is you know what is thesis i asked a lot of these phd students in the exam why you say sir what is thesis thesis sir is, is writing about sir this is a dissertation sir it's, it's uh, this sir. but what is the meaning of the word thesis thesis sir thesis thesis <laughs> this how we study in our schools just mug up do you know what thesis is thesis is a table in the king's court in the olden days so if you have a theory or if you have a proposal if the king accepts it you can keep it on the table that's called thesis today there's phd and if it can't be kept there and the king rejects it you keep it under it's called hypothesis mole de chirikane satyam parane chirikwa that's the truth but how many phd students know the etymological meaning of the word thesis that's the problem anyway come back then what happened after some time another group of ichthyologists went to the far, the sea and they caught fish their fish had a smaller net hole so even 1 inch fish were caught so their hypothesis said 1 inch also can be sea fish so another thesis so the present science of the west only five senses and these five senses measure whatever they measure at the given time and that's called the final word which is not and if you go with the smaller net to the sea you can get half an inch fish also it's called fish net hypothesis please go and read that fish net hypothesis read a little more and then you get what what all things happen in this world you just don't know this world is not what you see remember that so the man who got the nobel prize and the alternate nobel prize and wrote about what is called the real a duality says this world is worklich kit worklich kit in german means drama and he says it is maya shankara's maya so beautiful and that's the world is what not what you see it is something else but you are made to believe in something else which is called advertisement you know what is advertisement you don't know 1954 john kenneth galbraith who was a, the american ambassador in india in the 50s when before you were born this fellow was 7 feet 2 so when pandit nehru and he were walking pandit nehru had to look like that to look at him pandit nehru himself was tall but this fellow was 7.2 this fellow was a professor of economics in harvard he wrote a book in 1954 called affluent society where he says advertisement is not to tell the truth about the product to the community it is about make them entice them to buy that product when they don't even need it for example you go to a mall m a l l 
two shirts for one shirt's price. The wife becomes greedy. She says, you better buy the two shirts now because you know you won't get it later. This fellow doesn't need shirts. He has enough shirts at home. But she says, no, no, see, it's cheaper now. Buy it. So the shirt is sold. And what that mall has done, for two shirts price, they have one shirt prices. Well, has, has become. So they have not lost anything. But you, are, you become an ass that you bought the shirts when you don't need them. This is called advertisement. Same thing about medicine now. In the olden days, when we were all students, we took an oath, Hippocratic oath, and become hypocrites after that. But then, Hippocratic oath says, you should not even have a board longer than one and a half feet and one feet long. You should not advertise yourself. Today, my God, photograph of a doctor, the best cardiac surgeon in the world is standing here in XYZ for corporate hospital. Finish. That is not good. Because people should not go by that to get a cardiac surgery done. And when you go to meet your maker, then you can't discuss and say, Oh, I did a mistake. I went to the wrong place because of advertisement. Right? So that is what is... Nitya hita mita ahara sevi. Samikshakari. Work very hard. You must have seen our ancestors. Oh my God. I had a grandfather who, who lived up to 102 his fellow used to work even when he was 100. He used to go out. And he has to go to the court every day. With a lot of lands and everything. One day, you know, when he was about 100, his children said, you can't now go to the court. So they restricted him from going to the court. And the day he was restricted, he was feeling bad. And he felt bad and felt bad. Died within a, within a year. Otherwise, he would have lived long. Probably he would have lived for another 10 years. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. We didn't allow him to do that. Samikshakari. Then what does it say? Data. Data. Be a giver, not a taker. We are all takers. I'm looking for what will the now the IADK give me? What will they give me? And things. No. Be a giver. Give something to others. Data. Samaha. You know, you must look after everybody. Same way. A lot of us have this bad habit. If when you talk to the big president, hello sir, Jitin sir. Supposing the peon is there, hey, come here. No, no. You know, when I was a dean, a lot of these, you know, medical college and the dental college and all love affairs are very common. So when she loves a boy and then after some time she'll come to me and say, Sir, please give me some advice, sir. I'm, I want to marry Jitin, sir, and my friends. How do you think he's a good boy or not? So I tell them, look, I can give you ideas about Jitin between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. <laughs> between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m., what he does, I wouldn't know. <laughs> So don't ask me. Take Jitin for an evening date. <laughs> Take him to the restaurant and observe how he behaves with human beings. When he goes there, the restaurant chief comes there. He says, hello, sir. How are you today? How are you doing? Hello, sir. And then he goes near the table where you both sit and there's little dirt there. Then he calls that Hey, come here. Clean this. Don't marry him. <laughs> he is not an honest man. He treats different people differently. And that's for not good for health. Samaha. Samaha. Then Satyapara. See, you imagine for a minute, telling a lie is very stressful. Supposing I have to tell a lie, I must remember that every day. Because next time somebody asks, the same lie must come, no? So, that is a terrible stress. Telling a lie raises your blood pressure, your heart rate. Tell the truth, it's the same truth anyway, you know, wherever you are. What is there in it? You must be an open book. You shouldn't have any two things, you know, inside one, outside one. Same thing. Fine. Tell the truth. Satyapara. Kshamavan. You can do all these things, but others can come and slap you on the face. Forgive him. Poor man, he doesn't know. He knows not what he knows not. So forgive him. Shun him. Don't forgive him. Forgiveness, I tell you, is the greatest stress buster. And forgiveness. Lot of people come to me with ulcers in the mouth. You know? After ulcers, they have taken B complex after B complex after B complex. Then even the dental surgeons give them steroid ointments, etc., etc. I tell them, forgive. Make a list of people you hate. Forgive them. Absolutely simply disappear. Simply disappear. You just see that. You'll be surprised. I tell them, don't even tell your husband or wife. Close your room and make a list of people you hate. Simply make a list of people you hate. And then make an effort. Sit and meditate and say, I forgive B.M. McDay. After all, he's an ass. Let him go to hell. Just see. You relax. After salsa is gone, blood pressure gone, 
migraine gone, autoimmune disease gone, kshamavan. Then what does it say? Aptopa sevi bhaveta rogyam. Don't treat just your husband and wife as yours. Everybody is mine. Everybody is mine. He's my uncle, my aunt, uh, my niece, my nephew, my grandfather, whatever it is. You just treat everyone as your equal and your blood pressure will come down. Your cancer will disappear. Did you know that? Your cancer will disappear. Now, friends, something more about lifestyle. Today, science tells us that you and I are not solid. We are just liquid or energy. Now, when you are energy, the matter changes into energy and energy changes into matter 1024 times in a second. In a second. And remember, each time the energy knows the blueprint of the matter. So, Supposing, let us say, I have a problem in the eye. I was telling my friend. I can sit and meditate. And then I say, let my eye come back to its normal shape. Let my eye come back to its normal position. Let my eye come back. And next time when the matter becomes, energy becomes matter, let it correct it. Keep on doing that. This is called auto-suggestion. And this is called quantum healing. And lo and behold, your eyes get better. And people have now shown that you can sort of quantum heal anything. And please read that book, Amit Goswami's book, Quantum Doctor. And you as a doctor will get a lot of benefit because you can help your patients do that. A lot of things you can't cure, but you can. I'll give you another book, Anatomy of an Illness. Read that book, Anatomy of an Illness. Small book, written by Norman Cousins, a very famous American um, journalist. This fellow went to cover Kennedy Khrushchev meeting in the 60s to Moscow in December. And he, they were sit, standing in the tarmac. A jet was turning itself. In the sub minus 40 degrees centigrade cold, the jet hit him so hard that he fell down. And some peculiar pain started in his body. He was admitted in Moscow hospital, then transferred to Boston to Harvard Medical School Hospital, where they made a diagnosis of Ankylosing spondylitis. There's no treatment for that. You become stiff, stiff, stiff like a wooden log and then die. And they told him he will live for three months and they gave him a room and said, enjoy here because you are a very famous journalist. You die in Harvard Hospital itself. So he's lying there. You know, he's, he's resigned to his fate saying that he's going to die. All of his friends used to come and talk and talk. And one day somebody came and joked, really joked. And this fellow laughed for the first time. He laughed. Hard till he laughed. Norman Cousins laughed. And then he found his finger was moving. When he laughed, the finger moved. So his friend said, we must make him laugh all the time. Those days, no television. So they brought this 8 millimeter, that gudu 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 machine. In the olden days, when you were born, they probably you went to the cinema theater. It gudu 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 and then it stops and another gudu gudu gudu, it starts. Yeah. So this gudu gudu, all Charlie Chaplin and all movies, they came. He laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed walked out to Harvard Hospital after three months and remained alive for 20 more years to write this book to tell you how laughter can cure you. Just stress busters, that's all. What's the book name? Anatomy of an Illness. Illness. Where in the, what's the author's name? Norman, N-O-R-M-A-N. Cousins, C-O-U-S-I-N-S. You read that book. As doctors, as dentists. Now, don't have a classification of doctors. Today, quantum physics says, tooth is a part of the body. You will be surprised. You started with one cell, one cell. Eh? That included the tooth also. It didn't come separately. The impl implantology, it came. No, it didn't come. The tooth also originated from the one cell. And this cell divides, but divides in a peculiar way. That's the most important thing. Mark these words. It doesn't completely divide. There's a partial septum which comes and one becomes two. Partial septum comes, two becomes four. And then it becomes 12 trillion, one, 120 trillion cells. But they're all interconnected. It's called a syncytium. And very interestingly, unlike what we have, that organ-based thing, two brain cells may not have the same genome. A brain cell and a heart cell can have the same genome. A brain cell and a kidney cell can have the same genome. A brain cell and a gum cell can have the same genome. A gum cell and a tooth cell can have the same genome. So you can reconstruct any organ from any other place. You can even reconstruct a tooth. You can reconstruct a gum by quantum healing. And don't you call yourself a dental surgeon. 
because you can't deal with only one organ the organ specialization is gone and you are a human body healer call yourself a healer or a doctor if you like i am afraid to call myself a doctor because if you know the meaning of the word doctor you will be afraid to call yourself doctor comes from dossier dossier is to teach a doctor doesn't become a teacher teacher doctor is an who is a teacher teacher is an example for students a doctor should be an example to society and a great responsibility mind you you can't monkey around being a doctor you must be an ideal human being and very difficult so i don't call myself a doctor i call myself just a professor as as a teacher that's all and actually this girl was saying professor dr b m hegde there's nothing in the english the convention in london university is when you become a professor in the university you lose your other tags you become professor so and so or supposing you become a surgeon in london you call him mr so and so and if you are a woman you are called miss so and so so then after that there is no doctor there so it's just one of those things you know doctor is a very very big thing actually you know great things brainy fellows are called doctors and they are all examples to society and we should all try to be an example to society because society respects you society expects lot of things from you and society doesn't expect you to be a monkey and to be a monkey around so friends very easy to heal yourself quantum healing has come to stay and this is you know you you don't know you know we don't know what's happening in this world we as a team four of us went to brazil to investigate a man called john of god have anyone heard of him john of god have you heard of him you raised your hand no john of god is a villager farmer one fine morning he had a vision from god saying that you have power to heal so he started healing people left right and center and people slowly it is a small little village today it has become a huge town huge town and you go there you see lot of these crutches wheelchairs and are left there by people who came in wheelchair went back walking and we photographed him with five cameras in different places seeing him operate on a breast cancer the man comes a villager doesn't even wash his hands he stands there and then prays 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 for a long time and then picks up his knife on the table bread knife and holds the breast like that and puts an incision no blood comes out he puts his hand inside the breast and squeezes that thing out and then puts the breast there hand there and prays takes it out no scar also can you believe that you won't believe that but i can tell you i have got photographs of that and you must see the thousands of people who flock there and go back happy a lot of things you and i don't know the world is very wide and we have to know a lot and what we know what i know about this world is not even point 0001% of what is to be known hell of a lot to be known and that makes you humble 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 humility is education says india's system vidya dadati vinaya vidya vinaya sampanna the greatest degree is how humble you are in this world you are the educated man how arrogant you are irrespective of what a b c d you have after your name it couldn't matter you are nobody humility says look i am yet to know a lot and i have to know a lot and that re- really stimulates you to know a lot so friends only thing that helps you to live is your lifestyle lifestyle work very hard eat less talk the truth help others you live didn't you understand that very easy and all diseases start in the mind and all diseases die in the mind krodha shokha bhaya ayasa viruddha anna bojana taponalan katva amla kshara lavana tikshnoshtati rakta pitta prakopet all things come from the mind and where is the mind never mind you are the mind you don't have a body what you call as a body is an illusion of the human mind and the human mind is not in the brain every organ has a memory recently my friend in london did a transplant magdi yakub is a very famous cardiac surgeon and magdi when he did an operation he did an operation from a 19 year old boy who met with an accident and took the heart to a 56 year old man who had intractable heart failure everything went smooth but one thing happened this man who recipient was a pure vegetarian 
but after the transplant he wanted only chicken in the morning chicken in the afternoon and probably fish in the evening and 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 uh, beef in the mo- morning so everybody surprised what happened then they went back the history of the boy who met with an accident he wanted chicken in the morning chicken in the afternoon chicken at night and this vegetarian has become anti vegetarian so organs also are human beings and they have the same the mind is everywhere so mind is not confined to a part of the body now i will stop here you know why in all these things we should have a cafeteria approach not a camp approach in a camp approach everybody gets the same thing rice kanji in the morning and pickles but in the cafeteria approach you can get masala dosa you can get if you want masala dosa you want vada you want you know you want anything you want so now if inji individually you have any problem over lifestyle change or your own problems you don't say it's yours you say my neighbor has this problem you ask a question if i know the answer i'll answer it thank you very much good morning doctor good morning uh no sit down and talk <laughs> it's okay uh i wanted to know if there's any way you can uh, control allergy good good question i mean i've seen a lot of people suffer very badly because of allergy and if there's any treatment um i i'm sure medicine is not a solution but uh, some holistic good wait for it Yeah. Very good. Very Thank good. Thank you. Do you know what allergy is? The definition of allergy I'll tell you. Fon Pirquet is a French physician who defined allergy about 100 years ago. He said altered acquired capacity to react. Do you understand that? Altered acquired capacity to react. So allergy is not genetic. Allergy is not something with you. You alter yourself one day to become allergic to something. you know if you would have been eating let's say uh, pickles every day one fine morning you may be allergic to pickle unless you have come in contact with pickle earlier you will never be allergic even drugs like that unless you are exposed to a drug like penicillin allergy for example penicillium notatum is a fungus in the in the wild any all of us can come in contact with that somebody suddenly becomes allergic so it's altered and the most important part of allergy is the mind so half the allergy if not more than whole the allergy can be really eliminated if you analyze your mind and forget about the whole thing you fuss about it you become more allergic acute allergy steven johnson syndrome or acute collapse requires treatment temporarily steroids steroid is nothing it's just one of those placebos that you give to everybody for everything but uh, no, taking medicines in the chronic for allergy on a chronic basis is very dangerous because most of these anti allergy drugs which are called anti allergy drugs are very bad h1 blockers and they invariably increase the the qt interval in the heart and one of the quick methods of killing yourself very fast is being on anti allergic drugs continuously some of the recent anti allergic like like cinarizine are h1 blockers plus a1 blockers so that you your blood pressure goes down sometimes so be careful when you do, do these things and second thing is no doctor tells you or many doctors forget to tell a man anti allergy drug people should not drive a vehicle but they suddenly their level of thinking will go down and the judgment goes down and accidents are very common it is estimated that 50% of the road accidents are due to people taking anti allergy drugs without their knowing that and the one of the methods of anti allergy thing is how to change the mind quantum healing meditate and get it out and the nose nose allergy there for the the seat of the allergy is in the submucosal layer now there are lasers which can remove that layer and sensitize that layer desensitize layer and you you are you are all right in no time mm, i believe that most of our diseases such as cancer and stuff is caused by some kind of stress emotional mental but that doesn't help explain why 4 year olds get blood cancer and things like that how do children what a get beautiful cancer? question this girl is very good i like that girl <laughs> amma have you have you got into a 4 year old child's uh, mind i've tried to a lot yeah you have not been you will see a 2 year old child when you get the next child coming out 
it hates that child so much that it wishes the child can be killed they have tried to kill that they are also in the same world ma they have also got emotions which you and i don't understand they are also same zygote as you and i are and they also can think so you don't know what the what happens you know a lot of people ask why did ramana maharshi die at a young age why did shankara die at an age how do you know they had a tranquil mind they were good people you know you know for example you think i am a good man i may be a rascal inside you don't know you don't know really so a child also has emotions so child can a four year old child can have cancer nothing wrong in it you will be surprised to know that a child learns in your own womb did you know that yes yeah, and if you and your husband fight when you are having the child inside that child becomes a fighter when it comes out it can learn for you know 9 years for 5 for years in the house surroundings kurukshetra so, kurukshetra see how that uh, chakra we have coming out and going in etc today people are teaching mathematics to children in the womb yeah you can do that you uh, just uh, try this experiment you when you become next pregnant or your somebody friend becomes pregnant after some time you name the child you name the child something and call the child every day and after a few months you just simply call the child it moves in the tummy professor i've tried that my i have a 12 year old son who loves mathematics and i remember when my friends used to ask me when i was pregnant if i have any kind of urges to eat you know we have specific urges to eat and i had none but i used to want to do solve integral calculus you know enjoy doing that and my son loves mathematics good girl good girl indians are good at calculus after ramanujan you know <laughs> you will be surprised a professor of cardiovascular surgery in stanford such a big man his name was david eddy d a v i d e d d d y eddy at the age of 52 when he was ab- about to become the head of the department of cardiac surgery because his boss norman shumwe was retiring he said why am i doing bypass surgery it's unscientific there's no scientific basis i'm using linear mathematics or non linear organ he resigned his job can you believe that 52 stanford professor of cardiovascular surgery resigning his job and he joins stanford university for phd in mathematics Three years later, he gets the PhD in mathematics with the Henley Gold Medal, and a citation says, "David was the best brain in calculus that Stanford had in 350 years." And David goes on to change the physiology of man, and he has got a new physiology now called www.archimedesmodel.com. Go to the library, put it there. You get a, f- and then put your problems there. You get a solution there, and you will find whatever drug you give there, it says is horrible. Don't g- take that drug. and david is now professor of medical management in stanford university he doesn't do bypass surgery so good thank you here doctor don't ask a difficult question i have a couple of questions oh my god one is how do we get rid of the plaques in the arteries without statins for example and the second question is if someone is uh, detected with say 90% blockage or something and having stent implanted is good or not a <laughs> uh, good good both questions are good they are really good questions you know what it shows are you an engineer yes yeah, see I, how did i know how did i know because only an engineer can illogically think that if there is a block that must be removed there is a toilet block it must be removed no if the toilet pipe is blocked to water to come you put a new pipe but unfortunately the human body is non linear and non euclidean so you can't apply your euclidean in linear mathematics there when the block starts as a child you start god starts giving you bypasses they are called collaterals so it's good it is good to have a block remember that don't try to remove the block as a matter of fact we have developed a new system of yoga where you can produce blocks in those rare individuals unfortunately you don't have block i'll show you that it's very simple you know the sanyasis in the himalayas live up to 100 years you and i don't live do you know why we have too much oxygen here they have very little oxygen there up there so less oxygen means the heart gets uh, to learn to live longer so with the blocks coming nature has given the block the heart will live longer so don't try to remove that and whoever has told you that statin will remove the block 
must have told you or take the reckoning of the the golden path huh? now this is a very simple exercise this is very simple and it has two things it does a it helps your heart to have intermittent hypoxia you know every second part of the second you don't get oxygen the other half you get the oxygen so heart gets stimulation and it produces the blocks and helps the blocks and it's very simple and at the same time it exercises a beautiful muscle called psoas major it's a large muscle which starts in the chest at the back and comes down to the pelvis and holds on and comes and attaches itself to the thigh so that if you stimulate this muscle all the organs are stimulated every day in the human body it's very simple see stand like this of course now i have had a full breakfast i shouldn't be doing it but anyway let me try you should do it on empty stomach you stand like this and then breathe in and breathe out breathe out breathe out breathe out breathe out sit without a chair breathe out breathe out breathe out breathe out stand up breathe in breathe in breathe in now what have i done i have breathed out for 20 seconds without oxygen got to go to my heart and now breathing in so intermittent hypoxia i have given number 2 i have stimulated my psoas if you did it five times in the morning five times in the evening your blocks will increase you don't want that right and you will live longer how about the stent part i didn't want to answer that actually the stent will worsen the whole thing or, or a bypass surgery no no <laughs> both will worsen the whole thing now you live after that because of the placebo effect you shouldn't live after that actually bypass surgery is associated with double the risk of heart attack afterwards quadruple the risk of stroke afterwards sudden death increases afterwards heart failure increases afterwards nobody tells you this but your pain goes pain goes pain went without the surgery also you know that i gave you an example of placebo effect now you think uh, medicines will cure you i will give you a study this is a very interesting study recently published published in one of the most prestigious journals called science translational medicine stm and this was done in four universities oxford cambridge hamburg and munich led from oxford by professor bingel who is a professor of medicine in oxford you can uh, write down you can write i'll give you a reference good you have a clerk also <laughs> paid clerk or unpaid clerk i'm not the clerk i'm the boss <laughs> yeah i saw an american plaque which said i am the boss of the house i have permission of my wife to say so go on tell write down bingel b i n g e l bingel at all at all in latin means and others there are so many authors i can't tell you all of them and the the uh, this name, name is the placebo effect placebo effect p l a c e b o effect and the journal is stm science translational medicine year is 2011 volume is 3 page is 70 you read this what they have done is they did a study <coughs> of morphia morphia you know morphia biggest pain killer and they took severe pain patients severe pain the like of which you can't even imagine and they ran a drip of morphia in their vein okay but told the patient this is not morphia this is a, a new vitamin we have found out for your disease your pain won't go but you will get better 100% patients pain didn't go can you believe that what was running in their vein morphia and the most powerful pain killer right then they what is called crossover study they took the patient to another center they ran salt water saline in the vein and then said this is the latest salt of morphia very powerful your pain will go pain went did you get that that's the placebo effect so angioplasty scientifically is damaging the intim of the artery you are breaking it and then attracting a clot by evening that is closed whether you have a stent or a st no stent ordinary stent desiccated stent medicated stent etc etc is all for money nothing else and you get better because you are paid money placebo effect today the greatest cause of a stroke is not having diabetes or hypertension 
going to a hospital with bypass facilities after chest pain is the biggest risk for stroke. 50% of them get a stroke after bypass surgery. 97% of them get multiple emboli and they cognitive defect, which settles down to 47%. They don't know, they forget so many things. They don't, sometimes they forget their boss's name, etc., etc. You get the point? But this is not known, no? This world is worklish heat. Do you know how bypass surgery started? You don't know. And how it became a business? You don't know. If you knew, you wouldn't have bypass surgery. It is not an How I knew you were an engineer? I knew because a lot of people do this. This is this one man called Subramanya Swami. Have you heard of him? <laughs> some years ago, he came to me. Somebody brought him to me with some chest pain. Which was, of course, little. So, he, I examined him and said, look, nothing to worry. You, you're stressed so much. You know, you little go slow. That was the time he was contesting for the parliament from Madurai. And he said, what are you talking, doctor? There's a block. And I'm an economist. I'm a professor of economics in Harvard. I said, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. No, no, there is a block. He was removed, like you. Then I told him, it's not like that, Mr. Swami. You know, they, I told, explained to him, he wasted so much of my time. All free, you know, because these politicians, they don't pay. <laughs> but he would have paid. If I had asked, he would have paid. I didn't ask. <coughs> anyway. He went and had an angioplasty. After that, a lot of problems here. Now he's all right. Because nothing happens to these people. Nature looks after them. So I do this yoga technique for some children, unfortunate children who don't get blocks. And they develop blocks. Or even without the block, if you did every day this exercise, you get intermittent hypoxia for the heart. The heart lives longer. Now did you understand the difference between a dynamic structure which is non-linear and a non-linear structure, which is a toilet pipe. Or probably you are in the oil company pipe. Oil company pipe is blocked. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but you mean to say modern medicine is not good at all? No, no, I never said that. I never said that. Modern medical quick fixes are needed for an emergency care. But quick fix only. See, somebody, I, supposing I collapse now here. I can't uh, sit and do yoga and I'll say I'll be all right. <laughs> okay? Supposing I fall under a motor car, I can't. You know, I fell, fell under an auto rickshaw the other day. I survived by the skin of my teeth. I thank the auto rickshaw fellow for say, saving my life. This fellow was dead drunk at 5 o'clock in the evening. I was going for a walk on the footpath. This fellow swerved the rickshaw because he wanted to avoid a bus and came right on to me and hit me. If you look at my leg, you will get shocked. You will not come to Kuwait. But I told Jitin I am coming, so I came. And this, because see, this is, now I can't say I will do yoga and get it right, no. You have to do something, but I didn't do anything. But what I'm saying is modern medicine has certain role. But the percentage of people who benefit by that is 1% of the sick population. 99% of the sick population do not require modern medicine. It is used for money. I'll give you an example. One example will do. 55 million people in Europe do not go to work in, a day in winter because of the, what's called... Feverish cold. Simple disease. Feverish cold. 55 million. Now these people don't require modern medicine. Do you know what they require? A good dose of ginger, garlic and pepper. And they'll be fine. Next day they can go back to work. What do we do today? We give antibiotics to them. Send them home. If you give antibiotics to a viral disease, your immune system changes and the immune cytokine response becomes TH1 to TH2. And most of the TH2s are either vasoconstrictors or bronchoconstrictors. So by giving antibiotics to a viral disease, we produce manufacture asthma. Is it good? Or we manufacture a heart attack in elderly people. See? Do you know the amount of people who die of nosocomial infection in the intensive care units? We created that, thanks to antibiotics. So what I am trying to tell you is, we have a judicious mix of these things. Simple things can do that. A study in Canada showed when a doctor sees a heart attack in society, he will have seen 36,000 minor illness syndromes. There are four minor illness syndromes, which we don't even teach in medical college properly. Common cold, feverish cold, flu-like illness, and then sore throat. Simple things. Now a doctor doesn't know the difference. How many doctors can tell the difference between common cold and feverish cold? 
How many doctors know that the best treatment for sore throat is hot water? How many of us give antibiotics for a sore throat? This is the problem of modern medicine. I didn't want to go into that because, you know, all that, if you, it will be a big another medical college class. Difficult. But if you are interested, there is a book I have written, What Doctors Don't Get to Study in Medical School. Read that book. This book was so badly condemned when it came out in India. They wrote, this is a rubbish book and this fellow is a mad fellow, he, his English is not good, book is not good, blah, 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 blah. And the book sold, all the copies were sold in one week's time, thanks to that review. <laughs> then it got published in London and the British Medical Journal's editor wrote, this is not a textbook as claimed by the author, but certainly in my opinion, this is a holy text of medicine written by a prophet. <laughs> it is still going on in the fifth edition and Amazon is making sometimes money when it's short supply, they say $900 for it. It's 245 rupees in India. <laughs> it is selling. So this, these things happen. This is how commercial things. So my son uh, sells that book in America for, for the same, some $20 or something like that. And through Amazon he sells it. Is he a doctor? No. That's the good, the good thing. <laughs> my doctor daughters don't believe me. <laughs> He's an engineer like you. Doctor. Yes, sir. Thank you, doctor. Doctor, here, huh? uh, Doctor Hegde, thank huh? you very much for uh, for your uh, enlightening speech. I would like to ask you about. Uh, <laughs> I'd like. I'd like to ask you about uh, antidepressants for a long time, and their uh, benefits, if any. And uh, I know that you are What laughing. a beautiful question. What a beautiful question. Yes. You couldn't have asked a better question. This is a million dollar question. Thank you. Let me tell you something. When the mind is not in the brain, how can you treat depression with chemicals? Do you know what happens when you treat depression with chemicals? You become demented. And that's called Alzheimer's disease. One professor of neurology, I mean, psychiatry in New York, this girl wrote a book. Her name is Grace Elizabeth Jackson. What's her name? Write down. Grace Elizabeth Jackson. And the book says, Dementia, a drug-induced crime on mankind. Dementia, a drug-induced crime on mankind. Okay? And this book is selling like hotcakes and she has made millions but she has been dismissed as a professor of psychiatry from the New York University because of writing that book. Please read Grace Elizabeth Jackson's book and it will tell you it's a very nice book. It goes into the chemistry of it. I mean, when the mind is not there, the best treatment for depression is social support, behavioral therapy, group therapy. Patients come out of it. You know what happens when you take drugs for depression on a long-term basis? The patient commits suicide. One of the side effects of antidepressant drugs is it stimulates the brain to commit suicide. Now most of the crimes, even homicides, are due to taking antidepressant drugs. I won't go further into it. One example is German Wings plane was taken down by the co-pilot because he was on a heavy dose of antidepressants. I will go on and on and on, but that's a beautiful question. As a matter of fact, there is no scientific basis for treating mental illnesses with chemical drugs. For mental illnesses, only psychotherapy. For a mind which is in, at, not at ease, another mind at ease must set it in ease. Not a chemical molecule. Yes, sir. Doctor, most of the people now suffer from the diabetic. You no, that's not a wrong, <laughs> that's a wrong statement. Incidence of diabetes genuinely has not gone up. But we are creating diabetes. So, for example, he is in, in his area. You give that chemical for depression. What is that called? Thallium. Huh? Huh? Produces diabetes. Our friend takes statin. 40% of statin taking patients become diabetics in one year. So are we not manufacturing a lot of diabetes? I mean, of course, we are producing obesity, which is a, it's a, one of the important causes of diabetes. Obesity is very rampant in the West. Even in this country, I see... Almost every other person is obese. 
uh, if at all the person already got diabetic, uh, what is the solution? Without medicine, whether they can cure? That is very good question. Very good question. As a matter of fact, if you can control your diabetes without medicine, you will live 10 years longer than a non-diabetic. Did you know that? There's a study, beautiful study, Indian study, which shows that if you control your diabetes without drugs, diabetes can be easily controlled without drugs. Diet and exercise. Diet and exercise. One hour walking, 350 calories gone. 350 calories is 7 idlis. One idli is 50 calories. 7 idlis is 350 calories. So you walk one day, one, 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 one hour, so 350 calories gone. It's like, you know, bank balance. You put more money, uh, put less money in, inside and spend more money, there's less balance. Are you an economist? You're a no, doctor? Chartered accountant. Chartered accountant. Oh, see, that's <laughs> why I said that. How did I know you're a chartered accountant? You put less money in the bank, spend more money. So balance is less. Isn't it? See, chartered accountant, bright chartered accountant. See, how, how did I know? Good man. Walk, walk, walk. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. And relax, relax, relax. More tension, you, are, you want this, you want that. Chartered accountant, then, you know, especially if you're a chartered accountant, accounting the Ramana account, then your blood pressure, blood sugar will go up. Hello, sir. Here. Yes, young lady. Huh? What about hyperlipidemia? What is the <laughs> treatment you would suggest? <laughs> Amma. There isn't anything called hyperlipidemia. The more lipid in the body, the better for you. You live longer. We created a myth called fat is bad for the heart. There isn't any basis for that. Now, Americans are saying we are sorry for doing that. Now, you want USDA has put a 553 page document saying that Americans should eat more fat. They should at least have two eggs a day. And they should have more eggs and more green butter and more ghee and things like that. Who is this hyperlipidemia, the disease? It's a commercial disease. This. Why should you believe heart fat is bad? If you know, if you go back, it all started with the first study called Ansel case study. This man was given $100 million to study relation between fat and heart disease because already companies had drugs to lower fat. So this man created a study. He studied 22 countries and found there is no uh, relationship at all. He can't write a no relationship having taken so much money. So he made a paper by eliminating country by country by country without telling any people how many countries he studied. He studied 22 countries, presented six countries and had some sort of a relationship. But there was this professor called John Udkin in London in the 50s who had found out fat is very good for health and what was bad was sugar. So he wrote a book for you. You read that. You're an engineer, no? It's called Pure, White and Deadly. Have you seen that book? Ah, Pure, White and Deadly, John Yudkin. Now they demean, de demonized that man. They dismissed him, a professor of nutrition at London University. They removed his degree and they took, put him out of the GMC. And the poor fellow had to teach music to survive. And he has died. Now they say, oh yes, sugar lobby did this. And now it is found out for your information's sake as an engineer. The sugar lobby paid three Harvard scientists $50 million to create the fat myth. But luckily, all those three are dead now, so they can't be prosecuted. You understand now? Now why do you believe that? So don't believe anything. Go into it. Don't you believe anything. Don't believe what I say. Find out for yourself. Don't believe what I say about bypass surgery. Go and find out yourself. Then you know what's happening. Hello, sir. Professor, uh, what we can learn from the nature, like animals, do Be they have similar diseases? Beautiful, and, beautiful. And we have more diseases because we investigate more on us. What, what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Do you know what this is called? Disease mongering. We go after diseases and create diseases in human beings because we don't have what is called normal. We have average. These actuaries have taught us, the, act the chartered accountants have taught us. There was an actuary like, what's your name, sir? Vishweshwar. There was a big Vishweshwar in London in the 18th century. His name was Benjamin Grumpets. What is his name? Benjamin Grumpets. This man had written the actuarial data of human death and disease in the 18th century. And everybody forgot about it. That is lost. Now they have discovered in the debris of his old house, in the 18th century house, 
the document and they took it out and put it on the present actuarial statement. It fits in so beautifully, nothing has changed. But we have created more diseases by what is called disease mongering. Supposing I am selling idlis in India. I want to say idli is very good for everybody, no? So, if I am a doctor, I want more disease, no? You will be surprised in London, doctors were very happy when the smallpox epidemic used to come in the 18th century. That's the time they make more money. And 1823, the doctors in London were so bad, for your information's sake, that a doctor among them called William Bakley, uh, what's his name? Wakeley, Wakeley, W-A-K-E-L-E-Y, Wakeley thought the London doctors of 18th century, I am quoting his words, were a bunch of corrupt, impotent, nepotistic fools who have become an abscess on the human body like a pus. So he said, I am going to teach them science and then I will see that they become better. And he started a journal which he called as The Lancet, Lancet, knife, so that I will remove the pus. When did Lancet start? 1823. Who started? James Wakeley. Now how many years? 23, 16, 185 years. The present editor of Lancet last year, Richard Horton said, what has been the effect of Lancet on the doctors? You want to know? Don't want to know? If you don't want to know, don't know. <laughs> and he commissioned a Hillary, a Hillary Butler, a journalist from New Zealand to do the study. She studied and wrote, I quote, what was once a bunch of corrupt, impotistic, nepotistic fools has transformed itself into a corporate monstrosity which is cutting people left, right and center all over the world. You want to know? Hello, sir. Uh, I'm Vinayak here. I have one comment uh, based on what you told today. That you are going back to again age old uh, what our saints taught in India. Like uh, one of the saint... Uh, I remember in uh, Maharashtra was Samarth Ramdas, like Mana Sajjana, he will say, like, oh mind, oh great mind, listen to your mind and uh, do what what is right and what is true to be said. You are going back to that same old concept. Uh, I have one, uh, means, uh, is this uh, our Indian, uh, uh, the, the doctors who were earlier, which were saints, is that uh, we are going back to again that uh, 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 old era of the medication which is the uh, foundation of uh, whole medicine in India. Is that uh, you, you are pointing to holistic medicines and another point I want to make is that how do I avoid negative persons? Like there are a lot of negative people surrounding us who, who will influence us, us that you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, do this only. So, I just wanted to say two things actually. Thanks. Very good man. Very good man. The first thing you said is absolutely right. Knowledge does not belong to any particular era. Knowledge goes around in circles like fashion. You know, you are not old enough to know. There was a time when we were all young, the trousers were very wide here. Bell-bottom Bell trousers. They become narrow, 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 narrow. They become very narrow. Now they have started becoming broader and broader and broader. Knowledge is wisdom is like that. It goes round in circles. And I already told you, if you have not caught it, that I quoted Hans Peter Dior, who wrote a paper called Matter is not made out of matter, where he says, I learnt my science. Who is saying this? A nuclear scientist who was the director of Max Planck Institute in Munich, which is the highest body of physics and in Germany. And he followed Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, and then he's the director now. And he has been the director for 20 years. And he says, I'm a nuclear scientist. My job is to look at matter at its subtlest, subtlest, subtlest level. And now, one day I found out there is no matter at all. Was I surprised? No. Because I have been reading Indian sages who said there is no matter at all. And they said it is Advaita, Tat, Sat. So do you think he's right or wrong? He, you and I have no concern for our hoary past. That doesn't mean we can live in the past. You got to progress. But you can take a lot of wisdom from the past. You are absolutely right. And our, there's a lot of difference between our tradition and the Western tradition of reductionist science. Our tradition is the, you know, the whole science which is observational research. Thousands of years we have done the research. For example, are you, are you from which part of India you are? So, you are Bagal, Namur, Namur. See, 
lot of people, especially Brahmins in India, before they eat, they do what's called achamanam. They yes. take some water around the leaf and then drink it. Now they thought, it's, no, you all think it is foolish, superstition, whole thing. Why should I do that? But if you know now physiology, there's a tube which takes food from the mouth to the stomach, which is called the esophagus. And this esophagus is a closed tube. It's potentially open, but it's closed. Supposing you go there and suddenly take a solid food, like you, are, you had two pegs of whiskey and then take a big meat piece in biryani, that will get stuck there because it won't open. And a lot of people have died. Now this was observed by people over the years and they said, if you put a little water, the esophagus starts this peristalsis, like the snake, you know, starts the peristalsis. Right. They told people, do, do little water and then, you know, drink it. Who bothers? If you tell people compliance, they brought God inside. And then God means fear. So, compliance. They said, if you do this, God will be happy. So, everybody did. Hmm. Like that. So, the people, less people died. Isn't that a good method? Yes. Why can't you learn from that? <laughs> fear is the emotion which... No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying. Fear is just a byproduct. Yeah. What I'm yes. saying is, the minute compliance goes up, people survive. They knew that. Yes. That's why they made this. Yes. So, it is not anything bad. Oh. Do you know you, you ring a bell in the temple? Yes. Do you know now sound waves kill germs? Yes. Temple is a place where a lot of people come, a lot of germs can be there and germs like people crowding around in closed places. So all that is known, they knew that and the, this will jam, zap the germs. You know mantra chanting, the vibration that can kill germs. So all this is science but we don't want to know that. You know, we think modernity means it must come from the West. There's a wrong definition of modernity. Every modernity comes from its antiquity. Oh. So, Western modernity came from Western antiquity. And Indian modernity should come from Indian antiquity and not from Western antiquity. Did you understand that? Yes. That's the difference. Thanks. Good. He's a good boy. I know him. Good boy. But he has become a businessman. That's the only problem. You know, you, you know, have you seen his resort in San Diego? Oh, you must go there. It's a fascinating resort. You go there and stay there, you know, $10,000 in a week. You just enjoy Deepak meal, Deepak this, Deepak that. And he's a lot of so-called quote-unquote Ayurvedic drugs. I told him, Deepak, you shouldn't be doing, doing this Ayurvedic drug business. But that's his... And who are his clients? The big names in the Bollywood. So this fellow is... He has got a he has got a, a, a studio and apartment in Manhattan. So he flies to Manhattan every weekend and comes back and then you know he he enjoys life. But he's a good boy, and he has got writers to write the books. He writes the same thing again and again, seeing God, this fellow, that fellow, and all. So many books are there. Good books, good boy. He called me once for a lecture and he interviewed me, which came in the television in America. He said, "Sir, what is wrong with modern medicine? I said, everything is wrong." So it came, you know, big thing and people wanted to kill me. But then it's, the truth is, can't be, you know, truth is bitter. Truth is bitter. Basis is wrong. We have to use non-linear mathematics in the human body and not linear mathematics. That's all the difference. Yes. Uh, yes, ma. Uh, I'm hey. Dave. I would like to ask this question. Can music heal? Oh, what a beautiful boy. I love you. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come, come. Music is a big therapy, man. Come here. You come. Music is a big therapy. Come here. Ah, what a lovely boy. My God, I like boys like this. Come here, come here, come. Ha, ah, what a beautiful boy. What is your name? Dave. Dave. Ah. <laughs> Ayurveda has a special subject called Gandharva Ayurveda where for every illness there is a raga. There is a particular raga. And a man called uh, um, some Malayali chap, very interesting chap. He has now analyzed that and he has put that in a CD which is being sold from Canada. And if you tell them what is your disease and what is your horoscope and a date of birth etc. They will find a raga for your disease and you can buy the CD and listen to that. And this is now known that ragas can really heal. And as a matter of fact, a good music, if you listen to, your blood pressure comes down. Did you know that? We have done a lot of studies on music, blood pressure. But 
not rock music. There's a nice book written by an American professor called Closing of an American Mind. Young man, write down the book, Closing of an American Mind. His name is Alan Bloom. Alan teaches social philosophy in the Chicago University. A brilliant man. And Alan writes that all the ills of American society today in the 20s is due to the rock music of the 60s. And rock music, you know what the meaning of the word rock music? Anybody knows? Rock, 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 rock. Engineers up. Chartered accountants up. Rock, it's like a rock. Rock, 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 rock. Rock means sexual intercourse in African language. So the rock music beat is the sexual intercourse beat. So people who get delve himself in rock music, they lose emotions in sex later on. So the, the epidemic of today's divorce in America is due to the 60s, Abba, Giba and all rock music. And then rock music robs you of the peace of mind. And then so all kinds of problems come from that. Please read the book, Closing of an American Mind by Alan Bloom. B-L-O-O-M, A-L-L-A-N, Alan Bloom. Good boy. One more question. Yeah. Uh, is playing and hearing music is a good uh, lifestyle? Good, good, good. A very good boy, very good boy. Yes, yes, young dear. Yes, you are right. Music is good. You know, this, actually you will be surprised. If you attend a music concert and enjoy that, your blood pressure, we have seen blood pressures coming down. You know, some of these, you know, especially Indian classical music, the alapana, so nice, so nice. You become so tranquil. The cultural capital of India is Chennai. And if you go now, December month, from the 15th of December to the end of December, there are 50 Ghana Sabhas in one road. And they have music from morning till night. Different music, all big names. Karai Kudi, Mani, this fellow, that fellow. And all people sing there. And you would be surprised. You don't get a room in any hotel in Madras in December because all RNI, Chennai, it's RNI, they all flock there and listen to all that music and then go back to America or Timbuktu or wherever they are from. Or Kuwait for that matter. We will only have time to take two more questions. Hello. Good girl. Hello, doctor. Uh, coming to the subject of uh, preventive medicine, uh. Uh, we who work in the corporate sector and have a very sedentary lifestyle, uh. the only preventive medicine we know is going to India for an annual health checkup. <laughs> and uh, when we go there, they subject us to all kinds of tests and the readings, and we take that as gospel truth, and they suggest all kinds of medicines. What is your opinion on this annual health checkup? Very good, very good. Do you know what I wrote to the bank chairman? I wrote to the bank chairman, do not give money for your uh, people to go for a checkup. Give a bonus to people who don't go to see doctors at all and they're happy and give them one or two lakhs every year and they live longer, your bank will be benefit a lot. Otherwise, checkup, you know what is checkup? There are some tests, they run the whole test. And then you get some data, what is called result. And this data is not static. Supposing your sugar now, you know, we did some study. We pricked five fingers of a human being and took five blood samples. Within maybe a few seconds or minute maybe, the five are different. If they are different, he is a healthy person. Nothing will happen to him. Even if he is a diabetic and the five readings are different, he will not have any problem with diabetes. But if the five are same, you are either going to die very soon or you are a very bad diabetic. Remember that? So there is what is called healthy chaos. Every lesion must be like this. Blood pressure must be like this. Sugar must be like this. It becomes like that only when you are dead. So if your doctor catches it there, he calls high blood pressure. Catches it here, he calls low blood pressure. I will give you an example. What is the average height of an Indian male? This is a telling example. I tell people. I get fed up telling that. What we do is, we do an actuarial thing. You take 1,000 people and then plot it on a Gaussian curve, bell-shaped curve. Engineers understand, actuaries understand. So there are people with 4.6 inches height, normal. 6.6 .6 inches height, normal. Now what we do? We do mean plus 2 standard deviation. This is a statistical term. What is statistics, do you know? Huh? Check. Good boy. Who is that? Who said that? <laughs> Good man. There's a nice book for you. It's called Statistics, Science Without Sense. That's the book's name. 
Science without sense. The author's name is Stephen Milloy, who teaches statistics in Washington State University. Very interesting thing. Anyway, now you get what 5.4 inches plus minus 2 inches. Now let us say you go for a checkup. How tall are you? Six feet. Six feet. So he is abnormal. He is a disease. <laughs> so the treatment they prescribe is cut his leg and make him 5.4. How old? Is, how tall is your wife? Oh, uh, five ten. Five ten. Oh, she is also tall. Supposing you have a Jaya Bachchan like wife, four point six. And the treatment for her is transplant a leg and make her 5.6. This is what exactly is called to see. So preventive medicine is not the right term. Promotive medicine. The right thing is promotive medicine. Your company should tell you or you should do. You will change your lifestyle so that none of these things happen. Do you know what was Mahatma Gandhi's blood pressure? 200 by 100. Do you know who was not getting sleep? Sushil Anayar, his doctor. And the old man was sleeping very comfortably. And died of all complications of hypertension, including that God says bullet. So your blood pressure is what is your blood pressure? Is not my blood pressure. And there is nothing called normal blood pressure because I don't know. I have been researching blood pressure for 40 years. I have written a book on blood pressure. If you ask me now, I don't know what is normal blood pressure. And if you ask me what is my blood pressure, I don't know. Hello, doctor. Hello, sir. Hello. Good. Very good question. Portman Group of Alcohol Manufacturers created this myth in 1981, which was published in the British Heart Journal in January issue of 1981, where the editor wrote, now the doctor should go to society and ask everybody to drink so that heart disease will come down. And the truth is, every drop of alcohol damages the heart muscle, which is called cardiac cardiomyopathy. And there's a bigger cause of death, sudden death than heart attack. And this, this is why Garbacho banned vodka because 30 people were dying in the central hospital in Russia, Russia every Moscow every day of alcoholic cardiomyopathy cutting off the heart blood the, the circulation of uh, electricity <laughs> Mone, not even one drop is it moderation <laughs> hello. hello sir one you must change your idea of moderation yes Hello, one quick, quick question, sir. Quick, quick, quick. Uh, yeah. uh, as, as you said, most of the diseases are due to emotions and stresses. Uh, how do you explain these uh, diseases due to genetic disorders? For example, <laughs> re retina pigmentosa. Wait, 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 wait. There are, there's a difference between congenital de in inherited diseases and genetics as a role, call of cause of heart di the disease. Genes have no role to play in human life. Remember that? Genes have no role to play in human life. But there are some inherited diseases which are called genetic, which is not really genetic. All diseases, everything happens to man because of the environment. Genetics has gone. And human gene, if you want to know, human genome has only 23,000 human genes, two and a half trillion germ genes. You have virinomes, metabolomes, germinomes, etc., etc. So that what your parents contribute to you is 23,000 divided by 2.5 two and a half trillion. Where is our actuary? It will be one in a million chance. So one in a million chance sometimes you get retinal thing or you get a congenital disease. That is not genetic. None of the diseases that we talk about and we treat are genetic. They are environmental. And that's why lifestyle change is the only thing. Genes don't matter. Epigenetics has come. Darwin was wrong. Lamarck is right. And Darwin's own grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, told him, you are wrong, but he didn't listen to that. But Darwin, while dying, he said, yes, environment is important. But neo-Darwinists don't want to leave that because it's big money business. Today, do you know if you have a, if you have a pregnant woman, mother, wife, and if you are a moneyed man, a company will come. We will preserve your child's uh, cord blood for all times to come. Biggest myth. They'll make tell tons of money out of that. Nothing will come out of that. This all started with Stalin's death. They wanted to preserve Stalin's body. Nitrogen, liquid nitrogen. And tons of money. Even today there are people, rich people, preserving their body, hoping that someday technology will make them wake up and walk. Don't worry about that. Epigenetics. Have you heard of epigenetics? Read that. Hello, doctor.
Hilar Hegde, not doctor, Hilar Hegde. You know that now in West, it's the stress. That everything is related to stress. I was talking to a psychotherapist, a lady, and she said, do you know that in India, it depends upon you. I can't make you angry. You make yourself angry. If you can get that through, you will not feel angry. Good. That your wife can't make you angry. Your boss can't make you angry. You do it yourself. And that affects your health. Correct. So this is what I think very important for us to... Absolutely do. right. You said it. And look at this young man. He is so healthy, do you know why? He has got 14 kids. Out of which four are biological, 10 are adopted from different countries. And he enjoys them and he will never die. I can tell you that. He will never die. You don't have to have cryopreservation. He will not die at all. Thank you. You know, you, you know, autoimmune disease is what is called horror autotoxicus. Your own body cells damaging your own body cells. You understand that? It's the most dangerous thing to happen. Now your body cells and my body cells are the same. They love each other. Supposing you hate me, your body cells get confused. Why is she hating that poor man, BMI, poor chef, you know, he has come all the way here. Why is she hating him? Still you hate him. At one stage, your own body cells start hating your own body cells. That's called autoimmune disease. So, it's so if you have an autoimmune disease, sit in a quiet room and make a list of people you hate, you are you're angry with, as our friend said, and all that bad things, and make a list and forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. Autoimmune disease will gradually go down. Uh. No, that, that is a reductionist view. It is my passion. No memory. It's my passion. Uh, 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 last, last comment. I, I was just observing that, uh, I mean, I had an op occasion to look, uh, listen to other cardiologists, uh, Dr. K.P. Mishra also. I was just wondering why do the, all cardiologists after a certain time become phys uh, more philosophical than actually believing in their cardiology? This was one. Second thing is, uh, you you made a comment about, uh, I mean, if you are, uh, the, when the young lady there asked about a four-year-old child getting some diseases like, uh, I mean, leukemias and all, you said that their mental status and they are fighting and doing all. Then do you mean to say that a person, if he dies young, he has a very bad, bad mental status or something because Vivekananda died very young? And others, big criminals, they are living for more than 100 years and all. So, does the situation change in their mental faculty? And Oh my God, there's not one question. So yeah, many questions. Yeah, and, and last was just, just a comment which I want. I do agree that the pharmaceuticals do make a case for the, uh, for the disease. It was very evident recently with the swine, swine flu epidemic because the, the CEO of Tamiflu had one year before said that the total sale of the product would increase next year by 150%. How did he know? He was not a philosopher. He knew how to. Good. I definitely agree I will with answer you. your last question first. The company which Thank manufactures uh, or sales, sells uh, Tamiflu is not the manufacturer. And the company which produced the swine flu test is the same company. And they caught hold of a doctor called Dr. Oster Haas, a Scandinavian doctor, and made him say H1N5 is a new virus and is killing all of you. And now he is called Dr. Flu. And this doctor now is in jail because he has found that he took $10 million from this company to create the disease. And there is nothing called swine flu. Swine flu was a hoax. There's nothing like Zika. Zika virus has been there for donkey's years. Now suddenly in Brazil, there's so much of chemical spraying that microcephaly has become a big problem. And the chemical companies, the pharmaceutical, not the pharmaceutical, agricultural chemical, they didn't want the world to know. So they got hold of doctors to say, it's a Zika virus, we did it. Now it's all blown off. In Brazil, they found there's not a single child with microcephaly which had anti-Zika antibodies, number one. Number two, it's not K.P. Misra and uh, one or two examples are, you know, one sw swallow doesn't make a summer. 
every doctor who thinks if he thinks t h i n c k s then he will become a philosopher sooner than later you know when i wrote this first paper called unconventional wisdom in medicine 1968 people condemned me for that and this paper was rejected by journals for 15 years it was published in 1983 with my photograph on the blast head where the, the editor said i have never heard this sort of a thing and when it was published a surgeon in london wrote to me dr hegde up until i read your article i was also having similar thoughts but i expressed it to my friends they thought i was mad so i kept quiet now i have taken 100 copies of your article given it to all my friends thank you they don't think i am that mad after all thank you very much and